Okay, let's get into this. How exactly do we make our own opal jewelry? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Something's coming in. Now, everybody likes a good holiday, and, and I'm no exception. Now, I've done some extensive research on this, and you might even call me an expert at holidays. Sort of a holidologist. Well, there's Christmas and New Year's. Everybody knows them. In the United States, we have Thanksgiving, which is a pretty cool time. In Australia and in Britain, they have Boxing Day. Everybody likes a good fight, right? But the calendar has become as crowded as lawyers at a train wreck. Lately, a bunch of new, let's call them suspicious holidays, have come about. And number 10 is Singles Awareness Day. When I was single, I was aware of it every single day. Party of One. December 22nd is Global Orgasm Day. I thought that was every day. And number eight is Edible Book Day. Now, I personally find the older books easier to chew, but that's just me. Bon Appetit. July 14th is Shark Awareness Day. Well, when I'm at the beach, every day is Shark Awareness Day, if you know what I mean. Now, as everybody knows, April 2nd is Male Escort Day. I'm not sure that I fully understand what a male escort is, and I'm not sure that I really want to know. At number five is World Leprosy Day. Now, I don't want to make light of a serious disease, but all I'm saying is beware of armadillos. October 21st is the International Day of the Nacho. As far as I'm concerned, there's no food more deserving of a day of its own. Except for maybe fried armadillos. May 25th is Geek Pride Day. I think you'll agree that geeks deserve a day of their own. But what about the nerds? I don't think I know the difference. At number two is National Corn Dog Day. I sure hope you like grease. And by the way, don't eat the stick. At number one is the highly improbable Love Your Lawyer Day. On this day, parents of all lawyers get to share the love, but all the while thinking to themselves, why didn't she choose medicine? For the rest of us, we can wait until April 1st. I see you've come prepared, Sheila, but this, that's more like it. That way you can see and be protected from my germs. She's very concerned about it germs, mostly fomites. She wears a mask. You notice whose mask she's wearing. Uh, my only mask. Anyway, and down goes Sheila. Oh my god, this is a tragedy. Oh, the humanity. Oh my god. F fix your mask, Sheila. Well, you'll be safe down there, I suppose. Well, wait there till I need you, okay? I mean, it's not like you're not my assistant and you're not part of this this whole process, but I think, you're, I think you'll be okay down there for a few minutes, okay? I think she said yes. So, what did I want to tell you? Here's the first thing. This, let's get some water here. It won't be coming from where you think. This is really nice. And a Mooka Matrix. Where did I get this? From my own private stash? No, I bought this in Tucson and I have the name of a guy I think I paid about a hundred dollars for these two and these these will both make a couple of nice cabochons there but anyway I need to get you all this guy's name I don't think he's set up for mail order business but maybe if you bug him enough maybe well maybe he'll kill himself I'll give you his name and you know he's a big boy I mean I don't want to kill him and I'm sure neither of us wants to be dead in my last video on how to buy opal jewelry I didn't have time to cover what might be the most important topic of all and that is how to make your own opal jewelry why is making your own opal jewelry important well the reason it's important is because when you buy an opal pendant, you will be paying for the opal, you'll be paying for the setting, and you'll be paying for the labor. The jeweler takes all these individual parts, which are basically useless by themselves, and puts them together to make a usable thing, a piece of jewelry. Making your own opal jewelry is not very complex. There are three basic steps. One, 
get the opal, two, get the setting, and three, put the two together. Let's start with getting the opal. What kind of opal do we need? Well, we need an opal cabochon. A cabochon is one of the two ways that people cut gems. Most gems are cut with flat spots that are regularly spaced around the gem in order to reflect light. This is known as faceting. Most gems are faceted, and the best example is a diamond. So what kind of opal cabochon do we need? The type of opal cabochon that we need is called a calibrated stone. Sheila, I'm a married man. Bad. So where do we buy a calibrated opal cabochon? There are a number of places. I believe that Etsy is the single best place to buy opal cabochons. They have Australian, Ethiopian, and even man-made opals. The selection is enormous, particularly for Ethiopian opals. Another good place to buy it is Opal Auctions. Their strong suit is Australian opal. They sell solid opal cabochons, and they also sell doublets and triplets. eBay has a somewhat smaller selection, but they also have calibrated Ethiopian and Australian opals. So that takes care of the first part of making your own opal jewelry getting the stone. Let's talk about the settings. This is embarrassing. I hate to be seen like this. Okay, uh, one of these days I'm going to show you how to polish opals by hand. And I wanted you to see these. This is a 1500. Once you've got uh, your stone sanded down to about the finest sandpaper that you can get, get yourself a set of these goes from 1,500 to 1,800,000 000, and 12,000 mesh. Micro mesh, cushioned abrasive pads. All of them are in here. I marked them with the, with the, uh, with the mesh numbers. First of all, you can have any setting you want made by your local jeweler. It's not going to be economical, necessarily. If that's the way you want to go, then that's the way you should go. But for practical purposes, we, we are going to talk about several options for settings. One is a do-it-yourself, and two are pre-made. The first type of setting, the one that you can do yourself, is wire wrap. There are some extraordinarily beautiful wire wrap stones of all types. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States alone who specialize in wire wrap. And you can either learn to do it or you can have someone else do it. The advantage of using wire wrap is that you don't need to have a calibrated stone. You can use any stone of any shape. It can be round, oval, or freeform. It could be triangular, pentagonal, polygonal, polygamous. Someone who does wire wrap will be able to fit your stone into a wire wrap setting. I guarantee it. Where do you find someone who does wire wrap? I suggest that you go to a local rock shop. Most cities and small towns have rock shops. Many small cities have lapidary clubs. If you either go to a rock shop or to a lapidary club, there will be people there who know people that know how to do wire wrap. The best and simplest way to get a jewelry setting for your opal is to buy one. The two main types are bezel mounts, which are cups in which the opal sits in, and prong settings, which are like baskets that you bend the prongs over the stone to hold it in place. Both can be bought online Line. I usually look at places like Rio Grande and Fire Mountain Gems, but these places can be a little bit complex and they're sort of made for jewelers. It's much easier just to go to Etsy. The most important thing about buying a pre-made setting is to get the right size. You recall we bought a calibrated stone, one that is a specific size. Well, now we're buying the setting and the setting has to match the size of the stone. So, you're not satisfied with just a plain metal setting. 
right? Well, there is a way to make fancy, expensive-looking jewelry by yourself. You just have to buy the right jewelry setting. This is kind of a trade secret, but I'm going to let you in on it. You might find this on Etsy or elsewhere, but the best place to, to buy fancy settings is on eBay. On eBay, there are hundreds or maybe even thousands of Chinese jewelers that make fancy settings, usually of gold with diamonds embedded. The cost of these settings is much less than the comparable setting bought through a jewelry store but of course you can't really buy just a setting at a jewelry store. Well, you can, but you probably wouldn't want to do it. Here's what you do. Go to eBay and search for semi-mount, semi-mount, and then put the type of jewelry you're looking for, whether it's a ring. I would put semi-mount ring. For a pendant, it would be semi-mount pendant. Most of the semi-mount makers on eBay reside in Guangzhou, China, and they may all work for the same company, but they are independent contractors. When you buy a semi-mount, you usually have the opportunity to make an offer. I would recommend starting at offering 70% or maybe 80% of the asking price. You should be able to get at least 10% off. The other most important thing about these Chinese semi-mount dealers is you see a setting you like, but the size is wrong. You can send them a message asking them to give you a price, give you a quote for a similar setting of a given size. It must be around here somewhere. Stop it! Okay, in my last video, I promised that I would explain how the Romans polished their opals. Now, I always keep my promises, except, of course, when I don't. And there's only one reason that I don't. I forgot. Now, remember that the word forgot is short for forgot to remember. I know that's a pretty deep concept. I thought of it myself. Feel free to use it whenever you have the need. Back to polishing stones. In the ancient world, people noticed that the stones in rivers and streams tended to be rounded and smooth. They ultimately realized that the smoothness must be due to the rocks rubbing against each other or rubbing against sand, and that some rocks must be much harder than others. So if you wanted to polish a rock, all you would need to do is rub it with a harder rock, and that should smooth the surface. This guy learned to scratch pictures of his friends on the walls of his cave by using a rock that was harder than the wall. Eventually, early man became more intelligent, the wheel was invented, and that led directly to the development of the primitive grinder or lathe. The primitive lathe, driven by the movement of a bow, was invented by the Egyptians around 1300 BC. There's evidence of similar instruments being used in the East, in China, sometime at or before the Egyptians invented it. The Romans used a variation of this bow-driven lathe. Archaeologists have studied ancient Roman ruins and discovered what they used to grind stone. As lubricants, they discovered that barite, a barium compound, tin, and lead were used in addition to water. The stone of the wheel was likely made of a quartz-containing rock, possibly granite. This gave the rough shape to the gem. Other than quartz, the abrasive substances found in archaeological sites were emery and diamond. Emery consists mostly of corundum, as in rubies, which has a hardness on the Mohs hardness scale of about 9 out of 10. Very hard. Diamond, of course, has a hardness of 10 out of 10. Some believe that the Romans obtained their corundum and diamond from Ethiopia, while others believe that it may have come from India. Anyway, no matter where it came from, this is the technique they used to grind their stones and polish their gems. So Peter, I hope that answers your question. Well, here we are again at the end. I really apologize for such an erratic video, but it was so boring that I just had to spice it up a little bit. If you liked the video, hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the like button. I don't even know what the like button does, honestly. If you want to subscribe, we have a lot of great subscribers. And that's all for now. I'll see you next time.